Buddha, or Buddha Gautama, also known as Shakyamuni Buddha, was a great spiritual master from ancient India. Born as Prince Siddhartha Gautama in 5th century BC, he would have naturally inherited the vast wealth of a kingdom. However, the prince one day left the palace life in search of spiritual knowledge. After years of contemplative seeking, the Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. He then shared the merits of his practice by providing a method for other sentient beings to be freed from the cycle of death and rebirth. The rich treasury of Buddha's spiritual teachings on universal truths are studied and revered to this day for their deep wisdom and compassion. Today we would like to share with you the sage teachings of the Buddha, Chapter 1 of the Sutra of the Lotus of the Wonderful Dharma, also known as the Lotus Sutra. At that time, the Bodhisattva Maitreya had this thought. Now the world-honored one has manifested these miraculous signs. But what is the cause of these auspicious portents? Now the Buddha, the world-honored one, has entered into samadhi. An unfathomable event such as this is seldom to be met with. Whom shall I question about this? Who can give me an answer? And again he had this thought. This Manjushri, son of the Dharma king, had already personally attended and given offerings to immeasurable numbers of Buddhas in the past. Surely he must see these rare signs. Manjushri, why from the white tuft between the eyebrows of our leader and teacher does this great light shine all around? Why do Mandarava and Manzusaka flowers rain down and breezes scented with sandalwood delight the hearts of the assembly? Because Manjushri, I have been dwelling here, seeing and hearing in this manner many things, numbering in the thousands of millions. I see Buddha sons, proficient in both meditation and wisdom, who use immeasurable numbers of similes to expound the Dharma or true teaching to the assembly, delighting in preaching the Dharma, converting the bodhisattvas or spiritual practitioners, defeating the legions of the devil, and beating the Dharma drum. And I see bodhisattvas, profoundly still and silent, honored by heavenly beings and dragons, but not counting that a joy. And I see bodhisattvas living in forests, emitting light, saving those who suffer in hell, causing them to enter the Buddha way. And I see Buddha sons who have never once slept, who keep circling through the forest diligently seeking the Buddha way. And I see those who observe the precepts, no flaw in their conduct, pure as jewels and gems, and in that manner seeking the Buddha way. And I see Buddha sons abiding in the strength of fortitude, taking the abuse and blows of persons of overbearing arrogance, willing to suffer all these, and in that manner seeking the Buddha way. I see bodhisattvas removing themselves from frivolity and laughter and from foolish companions, befriending persons of wisdom, unifying their minds, dispelling confusion, ordering their thoughts in a mountain and forest for a million, a thousand, ten thousand years in that manner, seeking the Buddha way. Or I see bodhisattvas with delicious things to eat and drink, and a hundred kinds of medicinal potions, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. Fine robes and superior garments, costing in the thousands or ten thousands. Or robes that are beyond caste, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. A thousand, ten thousand, a million kinds of jeweled dwellings made of sandalwood and numerous wonderful articles of bedding, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. Immaculate gardens and groves where flowers and fruit abound, flowering springs and bathing pools, offering them to the Buddha and his monks. Offerings of this kind, or many different wonderful varieties, presented gladly and without regret as they seek the unsurpassed way. Or there are bodhisattvas who expound the dharma of tranquil extinction, giving different types of instruction to numberless living beings. Or I see bodhisattvas viewing the nature of all phenomena as having no dual characteristics, as being like empty space. And I see buddhisons whose minds have no attachments, who use this wonderful wisdom to seek the unsurpassed way. Manjushri, there are also bodhisattvas who after the Buddha has passed into extinction make offerings to his relics. 
I see Buddha sons building memorial towers as numberless as Ganges sands, ornamenting each land with them, jeweled towers lofty and wonderful, 5,000 yujanas, a Vedic measure of distance high, their width and depth exactly 2,000 yujanas, each of these memorial towers with its thousand banners and streamers, with curtains laced with gems like dewdrops and jeweled bells chiming harmoniously. There, heavenly beings, dragons, spirits, human and non-human beings, with incense, flowers and music, constantly making offerings. Manjushri, these Buddha sons, in order to make offerings to the relics, adorn the memorial tower so that each land, just as it is, is as outstandingly wonderful and lovely as the heavenly king of trees when its flowers open and unfold. When the Buddha emits a beam of light, I and the other members of the assembly can see these lands in all their various outstanding wonders. The supernatural powers of the Buddhas and their wisdom are rare indeed. By emitting one pure beam of light, the Buddhas illuminate countless lands. I and the others have seen this, have gained something never known before. Buddha son Manjushri, I beg you to settle the doubts of the assembly. The four kinds of believers look up in happy anticipation, gazing at you and me. Why does the world-honored one emit this beam of brightness? Buddha son, give a timely answer. Settle these doubts and occasion joy. What rich benefits will come from the projecting of this beam of brightness? It must be that the Buddha wishes to expound the wonderful Dharma he gained when he sat in the place of practice. He must have prophecies to bestow. He has showed us Buddha lands with their adornment and purity of manifold treasures, and we have seen their Buddhas. This is not done for petty reasons. Manjushri, you must know. The four kinds of believers, the dragons and spirits, gaze at you in surmise, wondering what explanation you will give. At that time, Manjushri said to the Bodhisattva and Mahatsattva Maitreya and the other great men, Good men, I suppose that the Buddha, the world-honored one, wishes now to expound the great Dharma, to rain down the rain of the great Dharma, to blow the conch of the great Dharma, to beat the drum of the great Dharma, to elucidate the meaning of the great Dharma. Good men, in the past I have seen this auspicious portent among the Buddhas. They emitted a beam of light like this, and after that they expounded the great Dharma. Therefore we should know that now, when the present Buddha manifests this light, we will do likewise. He wishes to cause all living beings to hear and understand the Dharma, which is difficult for all the world to believe. Therefore he has manifested this auspicious portent. Good men, once at a time that was an immeasurable, boundless, inconceivable number of Asamkhya Kalpas, or a very, very long period of time in the past, there was a Buddha named Sun Moon Bright, Tathagata, worthy of offerings, of right and universal knowledge, perfect clarity and conduct, well gone, understanding the world, unexcelled worthy, trainer of people, teacher of heavenly and human beings, Buddha, world honored one, who expounded the correct Dharma. His exposition was good at the beginning, good in the middle, good at the end. The meaning was profound and far-reaching. The words were skillful and wondrous. It was pure and without alloy, complete, clean and spotless, and bore the marks of Brahma practice. For the sake of those seeking to become voice hearers, he responded by expounding the Dharma of the Four Noble Truths, so that they could transcend birth, old age, sickness and death, and attain Nirvana. For the sake of those seeking to become Pratyeka Buddhas or self-awakened Buddhas, he responded by expounding the Dharma of the twelve linked chain of causation. For the sake of the Bodhisattvas, he responded by expounding the six paramitas or perfection, causing them to gain Anuttara Shamyak Sambuddhi or highest perfection, and to acquire the wisdom that embraces all species. Then there was another Buddha who was also named Sun Moon Bright, and then another Buddha also named Sun Moon Bright. There were 20,000 Buddhas like this, all with the same appellation, all named Sun Moon Bright, and all had the same surname, their surname Bharavaja. Maitreya, you should understand that from the first Buddha to the last, 
all had the same appellation. All were named Sun, Moon, Bright. They were worthy of all the ten epithets, and the Dharma they expounded was good at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. The last Buddha, when he had not yet left family life, had eight princely sons. The first was named Having Intention, the second Good Intention, the third Immeasurable Intention, the fourth Jeweled Intention, the fifth Increased Intention, the sixth Cleansed of Doubt Intention, the seventh Echoing Intention, and the eighth Dharma Intention. Dignity and virtue came easily to them, and each presided over a four-continent realm. When these princes heard that their father had left family life and had gained Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, they all cast aside their princely positions and followed him by leaving family life. Conceiving a desire for the great vehicle, they constantly carried out Brahma practices and all became teachers of the Dharma. They had already planted good roots in the company of a thousand, ten thousand Buddhas. At that time, the Buddha Sun Moon Bright preached the Great Vehicle Sutra entitled Immeasurable Meanings, a Dharma to instruct the Bodhisattvas, one that is guarded and kept in mind by the Buddhas. When he had finished preaching the Sutra, he sat cross-legged in the midst of the Great Assembly and entered into the Samadhi of the Place of Immeasurable Meanings, his body and mind never moving. At this time, heaven rained down Mandarava flowers, Great Mandarava flowers, Manzusaka flowers, and Great Manzusaka flowers, scattering them over the Buddha and the Great Assembly, and everywhere the Buddha world quaked and trembled in six different ways. Monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen, heavenly beings, dragons, yakchas, or nature spirits, Gandharvas, or a race of demigods, asuras, or lowest rank of deities or demigods, Garudas, or beautiful wise bird creature that combines the features of gods and animals, Kimnaras, or celestial musicians, half human and half bird, and Mahoragas, or great serpents, the human and non-human beings in the assembly, as well as the petty kings and wheel-turning sage kings, all those in this great assembly gained what they had never had before, and filled with joy, pressed their palms together and gazed at the Buddha with a single mind. At that time, the Tathagata emitted a ray of light from the tuft of white hair between his eyebrows, one of his characteristic features, lighting up 18,000 Buddha lands in the eastern direction. There was no place that the light did not penetrate, just as you have seen it light up the Buddha lands now. Maitreya, you should understand this. At that time in the assembly, there were 20 million bodhisattvas who were happy and eager to hear the Dharma. When these bodhisattvas saw this beam of light that illuminated the Buddha lands everywhere, they gained what they had never had before. They wished to know the causes and conditions that had occasioned this light. At that time, there was a bodhisattva named Wonderfully Bright who had 800 disciples. At this time, the Buddha, Sun, Moon, Bright, arose from his samadhi and, because of the Bodhisattva, wonderfully bright, preached the Great Vehicle Sutra called the Lotus of the Wonderful Dharma, a Dharma to instruct the Bodhisattvas, one that is guarded and kept in mind by the Buddhas. For sixty small kalpas, or a period of 432 million years of mortals, measuring the duration of world, the Buddha remained in his seat without rising, and the listeners in the assembly at that time also remained seated there for sixty small kalpas, their bodies and minds never moving, and yet it seemed to them that they had been listening to the Buddha preach for no more than the space of a meal. At this time in the assembly, there was not a single person who, in body or mind, had the least feeling of weariness. Join us again next Wednesday for part three of Buddhism's Sacred Scripture, the Sutra of the Lotus of the Wonderful Dharma, Chapter One. Thank you for your enlightened presence for today's episode of Between Master and Disciples. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television for Planet Earth, Our Loving Home, coming up next after Noteworthy News. May heaven grace your life with everlasting love and harmony. 
For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash BMD.